Let's bow in prayer. Here we are, Lord. We are available to you. Speak to us now through your word. Amen. Well, today I'm going to talk about leadership in our congregation, and especially about the biblical office of elder. And I'm doing this for three particular reasons. First, as a Presbyterian church, our congregation is led by those who are called to the office of elder. Second, we elect new elders to our session every two years, and this is an election year. And so last Sunday, if you were here, you'll remember that the session announced that it's decided to add six new elders to our session. We need six elders, partly to replace those who have finished their present term, and also to fill some vacancies that we had on session. And third, we're going to talk about the eldership today because not everyone understands what an elder is or what an elder does in our system of church government. So in order to make good choices when we vote for our new elders, it's important that we talk about what the Bible teaches us about elders and about the eldership. So let's start with some simple basics. The best place to begin, I think, is to start with five statements that summarize what the Bible teaches about ministry. Now, these statements are all taken from living faith, which is the summary of what we believe as Canadian Presbyterians. Uh, by the way, these statements um, involve and are supported by um, around 30 Bible verses and uh, Bible passages. We just don't have to go through time to go through them one by one unless you want to be here till Monday morning. So we'll use the summary statements instead. So what do Presbyterians believe about ministry? Well, first we believe this, that the Lord continues his ministry in and through the church. All Christians are called to participate in the ministry of Christ. As his body on earth, we all have gifts to use in the church and in the world to the glory of Christ, our King and Head. The second thing we believe about ministry is this. Through the church, God orders this ministry by calling some to special tasks in the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now that word saint simply is referring to Christians and the body of Christ of course is simply referring to the church. The third thing we believe about ministry, and this is so important because we're presently searching for a new minister. We believe that ministers of word and sacrament are set apart to preach the gospel, celebrate baptism and holy communion, and exercise pastoral care in Christ's name. Their ministry is an order which continues the work of the apostles. Now, the apostle, the word apostle simply means a person who is sent and is referring here to Jesus' 12 disciples and to the apostle Paul. So, their ministry is an order 
which continues the work of the apostles, and Christ preserves this order today by calling to it men and women, and the church recognizes this calling in the act of ordination. That word ordination means set apart. So ministers are set apart to be ministers of word and sacrament. Now that word ordination appears in our next section as well. Here's the fourth thing that Presbyterians believe about ministry, and this is the important section for us today. Living Faith section 724. Through the office of ruling elder, men and women are ordained to share with the minister in the leadership, pastoral care, and oversight of the congregation. Let me repeat that. Through the office of ruling elder, men and women are ordained, they're set apart, to share with the minister in the leadership, pastoral care, and oversight of the congregation. Now, we're going to skip over the next section in Living Faith because it talks about specialized ministries such as hospital chaplains or professors in our theological seminaries. And we'll go right to the concluding statement that says that through such ministries, through all the ministries we've described, starting with all Christians being called to ministry, the word is proclaimed, God's people are nourished and nurtured, supported and guided, and in the oneness of Christ, we seek to serve God. That's the goal of all ministry, to seek to serve God, to be a community of faith where together we serve God. Now, let me move on. Although the office of elder is deeply rooted in the scriptures of both the Old and the New Testaments, by the end of the second century, the threefold ministry offices of bishop, priest, and deacon had become the dominant form of church government for a lot of historic reasons. And the office of elder itself lapsed in the church, especially as the Roman Catholic Church developed its offices of ministry. But during the great reformation of the church in the 16th century, the office of elder was revived by Protestant churches, and especially by the churches that we now call Reformed and Presbyterian. So that Presbyterian and Reformed churches have been led again by elders now for over 500 years. Within Presbyterian church government, and this relates back to those statements we looked at earlier, there are what you might call two classes of elders, although they're actually equal. The reformers refer to teaching elders. We call them ministers of word and sacrament. Yes, that's right. I am an elder of the church. All of your ministers have been elders of the church. But as our primary role is to preach and teach God's word, and to administer the sacraments of baptism and Holy Communion, we are designated as teaching elders. Uh, the other group of elders are called ruling elders. Let's go back to that 
living faith statement again, that through the office of ruling elder, men and women are ordained to share with the minister in the leadership, pastoral care, and oversight of the congregation. Now, now make sure you get that part, that teaching and ruling elders share together in the leadership, pastoral care, and oversight of the congregation. Now, because the reformers wanted to create balance within the leadership of the church, they returned to the biblical practice of ruling elders being chosen from within their own congregation to serve in that office of ruling elder. Just as in the same way, a congregation seeks out and calls a particular person by their own vote to be their teaching elder or minister. So a ruling elder is simply a member of the congregation, in our case, a member of First Presbyterian Church, who is elected by the congregation to serve as a member of the church session and to share with the teaching elder or the minister in the oversight, care, and leadership of the congregation. Now, let me just talk for a moment about that particular word, session, because that is really a Presbyterian kind of word. Because there is often a judicial function to local church leadership, the session is called a court of the Presbyterian Church. We'll have to talk about courts of the church at a different time. But the four courts in the Presbyterian denomination are session, presbytery, synod, and general assembly. But the session, which is the one that we interact with the most as a congregation, refers to when the elders gather for their meetings. It's not a secret society. Think of the word you'd hear in a courthouse. The court is now in session. In other words, the teaching and the ruling elders of the congregation have gathered to meet, to do their work. That's all it means when we use the word session. If you want to think of session another way, we could describe it as a church council or as part of the leadership team. Now, let me make an important point here that a lot of people don't understand. Elders do not have any individual authority as such. The oversight of the congregation lies only in the session as a group. Although in certain circumstances, the session may give an elder authority to do something on behalf of the session. But the authority remains with the session, not with the elder as an individual, and not with the minister. You may not know this, but I can't conduct a baptism unless the session agrees. I can't celebrate communion unless the session agrees. I can't admit new members into the church unless session approves those people for membership. 
Ministers don't have half the power most of you think they have. The authority is with the session, not with any individual member of the session. Now, one more piece of this puzzle. In some congregations, elders are elected and serve on session for life. In fact, when I was ordained as a minister in 19... Um, actually, it was 1977, and it was a long time ago. And for the first part of my congregational ministry, that was the standard practice. When you were elected as an elder, you served in session for life, for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, unless you moved, resigned, or most likely died in office. And in some congregations, they've still chosen to do that. Now, before I develop this a little bit further, let me explain that we as Presbyterians believe that just as ministers of word and sacrament are ordained for life, so are ruling elders. We believe that this is God's call upon certain people's lives. But clearly, not everyone feels that they can serve actively as a member of session for their whole life. Other opportunities open up for ministry. Family needs change. Health concerns arise. Age takes its toll. So in 1997, the Presbyterian Church in Canada decided to offer congregations the opportunity to introduce what is called term eldership. And we decided a long time ago at First Church to adopt term eldership. That means that our elders are elected for a six-year term, with one-third of the elders retiring every two years. However, elders can be elected for more than one six-year term if the congregation decides to vote that way, or if they take some time off, they may be re-elected to session at some point in the future if the congregation so votes that way. So, as we continue to unlock this, because of term eldership, we have two categories of elders at First Church. First, there are those elders who are presently serving as members of session. And then there are those who were elected to the eldership in the past and who remain elders, because remember elders are ordained for life, but who do not presently serve on session. So we have session members and we have those folk that we call sustaining or supporting elders. They're out in the congregation. They're strengthening and supporting the congregation through being active members of the congregation, through serving in different ministries, by simply being there to give advice when that's needed. They just simply currently don't sit as members of session. So about now, we need an illustration of this. Could I ask the elders who are currently serving on session to please stand for just a moment? There's some down here, 
Jonathan Brown's at the back, Karen Wolfe's at the back, uh, Murray Morrison, Yancey and Denman are up in the balcony. Thank you. Now, can I ask anyone who is a sustaining or a supporting elder to stand up? Okay, we've got four and one up in the balcony. Oh, thanks, Brian. Better late than never. <laughs> okay, thank you. You see, often we're not aware of who our elders are, and the session's going to do something to help fix that in the next little while so that we have more visual images for you. Now, let's move on. I talked about how elders appeared in both the Old and the New Testaments, but how, as the church developed, this particular office was neglected until it was rediscovered during the Reformation. By Reformed and by Presbyterian churches. Now, by the way, there are over 70 million Reformed Presbyterians around the world. Although we're a small group, statistically speaking, in Canada, throughout the world, we're absolutely a huge group. And those words Reformed and Presbyterian are almost interchangeable. So, did you know that the English word Presbyterian comes from a Greek word in the New Testament. The Greek word is the word presbyteros, from which we get the word Presbyterian. And the word presbyteros in New Testament Greek means elder. Surprise, surprise. So to say that we, that we are Presbyterian means that we adhere to the Reformed teachings of the Reformation and that we elect elders to provide spiritual guidance and oversight to our congregation. To be Presbyterian is to be led by those called to the eldership just like in the New Testament churches. So let me take you now to a scripture passage, to Acts 14, verse 23. This verse comes in the early years of Christianity as the church is rapidly expanding. And two of the early missionaries of the church, Paul and Barnabas, were traveling around the Middle East and particularly Europe, telling people about Jesus and starting new churches. We come across this insight, Acts 14, verse 23. In each church, they appointed elders, and with prayers and fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Translation, in each congregation they appointed presbyterus, Presbyterians, elders. Now let's go to Titus chapter 1 verse 5. The appointment of elders was so important in the early church that when the great missionary of the church, Paul, visited the Greek island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. He left his assistant Titus behind to complete two very important tasks. Paul says, I left you in Crete so that you could put in order the things that still needed doing and appoint church elders in every town. Titus was to make sure that presbyterus, that elders, were appointed in every church to provide leadership and spiritual oversight 
over these congregations of God's people that were being planted and established. So let me say it again. To say that we are Presbyterians simply means that our congregation is led by those who are appointed by the congregation to be ruling elders. Because we believe that that model of church government has deep roots in the Bible and has served the church well over the centuries. Now, there's one final key belief that Presbyterians believe about ministry and about leadership in the church. It's found in Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 to 19. It says, Christ existed before all things, and in union with him, all things have their proper place. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. For it was by God's own decision that the son has in himself the full nature of God. As Presbyterians, we believe that Jesus Christ is the only king and head of the church. That means that as members of this congregation, as we elect and ordain elders, we are seeking the will of God because we are seeking men and women to guide our congregation according to scripture and what it teaches us as we listen always for the continuing guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so important that we prayerfully ask God as a congregation whom we should choose as our new elders. So I'm calling on all of us to make this the focus of our prayers over the next few weeks. Because here's what I believe firmly. With prayer, the election of elders is a life-transforming experience for a congregation and for those the congregation call to eldership. Without prayer, it's simply a popularity contest, and that's not what it's supposed to be. So will you join me in this next few weeks, asking God to lead us to elect the people that he wishes to exercise oversight over us as we choose our new elders. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, King and Head of the Church, guide us as we begin the process of electing new elders to serve as members of session. May your Spirit lead us to choose those people that you would have us call to this office. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we sing our next song, I just want to give you some administrative announcements. Today, you can pick up your eldership ballot package from one of the elders in the Welcome Center. You will need one package for every church member in your household. The elder will simply record your name so that we know who has taken a ballot, but the ballots are totally anonymous. 
just a reminder that the privilege of electing elders belongs to those who are professing members of the congregation. And the ballot package contains a list of all those persons so that you can check your eligibility to vote. If you're watching online, you can pick up your ballot package at the church office during office hours, or you can call the church office for one to be mailed out or to be delivered to you. Ballots must be returned by Sunday, May the 14th at noon, if you like, after worship. So this gives you three weeks to pray and to discern and to complete and to return your ballot. Now again, remember that this is a process about discerning God's will for you as an individual and for us as a congregation. When I'm back with you on May the 7th, I'm going to speak a little bit more about what the Bible speaks about, the qualifications for the eldership, but I'm going to make sure that Marlene sends out those Bible passages um, in a MailChimp this week.